Chill, chill out in terms of using land unsustainably because they can actually be uh, rewarded uh, uh, in terms of assistance. If you read the Crichton.com article, I've got a photocopy for you. You'll, um, you'll see some criticism of the agreement this week uh, saying that uh, irrigators have managed badly in Victoria and are going to be compensated with those who have been proactive and got ahead of the game are going to be disadvantaged. In Australia, there's been a long history of so called closer settlement schemes. Uh, and uh, after, particularly after both World War Wars, uh, what we did for return servicemen as a, a reward for their heroic services and risking their lives was to give them a block of land and tell them to farm it. In many cases, they've never been on the land before, and in some cases, they weren't given enough land to, to do that sustainably. So after the First World War, they were given 640 acres often in areas um, such as around Shepparton in Victoria. Uh, after the Second World War, there wasn't so much land left in, in better watered areas, and they tended to be right out in the valley. And unfortunately, they were given off the same size blocks of land, and, and many of those areas uh, quickly became a uh, dust bowl because of, uh, it just wasn't possible to make a living on that much land. So, all, all examples of government driven policy um, um, constraints to sustainability, as Andrew says, and farmers often um, have a very long memory and uh, will say, well, the government's telling us to plant trees now, but 20 years ago they were telling us to chop trees down. Uh, so what, sh what should we do and how can we listen to it? One of the best books available on, uh, on land degradation and soil erosion is written by a British geographer. I highly recommend it if you're interested in this area or if you're interested in doing further study in it. And he takes a political economy approach. And I really like this quote uh, where he's saying that social scientists working in developing countries have known for a long time the land degradation is a social, is much about a social process as a physical one. And what, what interests me is that um, people at, at Western scientists from developed countries talking about developing countries, and in some ways it's easier for us to see things clearer when we look in other context. Uh, but obviously this quite relates equally well to developed countries. So uh, land degradation is uh, a result of social processes as well as physical ones. And you need, as we've been stressing right through this course, to link the biophysical with the social. You have to understand what it is that drives unsustainable uh, farming practices. So, as I've argued, the technical scientific model for addressing land degradation has clearly failed in many ways, and the current extent of land degradation in Australia highlights this. Um, but we need to move on to different approaches. And the main reason I would argue that it hasn't worked is that so many of the social factors, the cultural factors, have been ignored, and Landcare's strength and potential is that it addresses some of these social factors. So Landcare has enormous potential to, to address the land degradation crisis because of, it is focusing on social processes. It's based on the principle of individual and ownership of land degradation, and this is a recognition that the, uh, that the, 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 the solutions um, and remedies will not materialise unless landholders are committed to assuring that they occur. So it's not a matter of a bureaucrat in Canberra or sitting on Melbourne saying, you should fix up your farm. It's about local people having the resources to address those problems themselves. So I've said about, a lot about what is land care, so particularly if you're not from Australia, you might know much about it. Um, but so lots of, lots of different things. So, it's a community, um, a local community action um, process to repair land degradation. It's a grassroots voluntary movement at the brown end of the green spectrum. So a lot of people, particularly in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, it was kind of sort of new issue to focus on so-called brown issues. So there was a lot of focus uh, then on um, cute and cuddly animals, on uh, preserving rainforests, and people were saying, no, the will crucial issues in Australia, soil erosion, sewerage, water quality, so-called brown issues that we need to get a handle on. Landcare is a really good example of a group extension program, and I'll say more after the break about extension. So the uh, traditional government-based idea of getting information out to communities was, was called extension. Uh, it still occurs, and uh, many people uh, doing courses like this go off and end up working in areas for the state governments where they're taking information out to farmers landholders saying these are some new ideas on how to manage your farms. But as I say, Landcare has also made it clear to those very people that they need to also become facilitators and learn from the farmers and do that in a two-way process. Landcare has been a very effective way of delivering government funding and technical aid. It's been, some people would argue, a way for the state to shift responsibility from land degradation to the community level. So part of economics, um, uh, so-called economic rationalism, 
government getting out of things, so some people have done the maths of what I argue is actually less spending now in rural Australia than it was 15, 20 years ago, and Lanka has been a way for government to remove its responsibility from those areas. Lanka has clearly has been a strategic approach uh, to land conservation issues demanding cooperation at scales greater than individual property. So these issues of land degradation in Australia aren't going to be solved if individual farmers are just going to be working on their own farm, they need to put it together. And that's been Lanka's great strength. Lanka has been very, very effective at raising awareness. Um, so there's a much greater awareness in, in rural Australia now of environment issues. And farmers will say, we've always been interested in the environment, uh, but it just wasn't very cool to say you're interested in the environment. That was kind of preserved for urban greenies. Uh, but now it's okay for us to go to the RSL once a month and talk about land degradation issues or walk around each other's farms and compare notes on how to address those issues. It's been very effective, uh, therefore, for enhancing farmer to farm communication. So rather than pretend you don't have a saline patch, uh, people are now saying, got the salt patch, and this is what I'm trying to do about it. Uh, and some of the next farmers say, this is what I'm trying to do about it. So it's become a forum for community learning, for people to come and dis discuss learn about and act upon issues of common concern. It's been an outlet for uh, land users to be keen to improve their land management. So most rural Australians who are managing land are keen to do something to improve land management, and Landcare has come along and provide forums to do that. Um, a lot of people say Landcare has become a very important social focus in communities. Um, so there's been a decline in population in many areas in rural Australia. Uh, there's been problems in terms of unemployment, suicide and such forth. So, such forth. so a whole range of social pressures and land has played a really important community role. I've heard in my research and brain that it's both the Greenie and the government plot, so I probably can't be both simultaneously, but both Greenies and, uh, and, um, and, and uh, anti-Greenies can say it's a plot on the other side. And in fact, it's all those different things. So it's a, it's a many, many, many headed beast. <clears throat> um, so Landcare started in the early mid 1980s. And the really interesting thing about it in terms of government policy is that it's the government can start it, communities started. It. So again, when looking at successful government policy, often it's a matter of identifying things that are already happening and facilitating them. So increasing the capacity of communities to do things for themselves. So rather than being dreamt up in Canberra. It was actually something that lots of farmers started to do in small groups. So again, I think perhaps the single most important thing to learn from the land care model is that governments, if they're proactive, can identify the strengths of communities. And Australian rural communities have enormous strengths in terms of community cohesion, enormous social capital. Um, uh, just the uh, small communities where everybody knows each other have the capacity to do things, uh, particularly if they're given small amounts of resources. So Landcare built upon existing um, farm tree groups in Western Australia and, and uh, land conservation district committees. So this, this small group started in the mid 80s. Uh, and then what happened was that the Australian Con Conservation Foundation and the National Farmers Federation got together. I mentioned this in an earlier lecture uh, where uh, Philip Toyne from the Australian um, Philip Toyne, the executive director of the ACF and Philip Sorry, Philip Toyn from the National Farmers Federation and Rick Farley, sorry, Philip Toyn was from the ACF and Rick Farley was from the National Farmers Federation. And they literally got together at the parliamentary bar and uh, dreamt up this idea and took it to a consensus oriented the Prime Minister at the time, Bob Hawke, who, who, um, who seized upon it as a way of bringing together what seems to be warring parties. I used to get Rick Farley and um, Philip to come and talk to this class, and they gave a couple of amazing lectures in the uh, early, late 1990s. Um, and um, Philip always talked to, sorry, Rick always talked about how his fellow farmers said he was supping with the devil uh, to be talking to the conservationists. Told he needed a long spoon to be supping with the devil. Um, his argument then was that farmers had to engage with conservation issues. And he used the same model a couple of years later when the Margo decision came out saying rural Australians have to deal and understand the implications of Marlowe rather than avoiding them. Um, so this unholy alliance was conceived in the parliamentary bar. Um, the birth involved um, getting some parliamentaries, getting some various ministers on side. 